Well, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1 is where we'll begin to read in just a moment. We have, in this year of interruptions, been talking about how those familiar characters of the Christmas story had their lives interrupted. Last week, we looked at the life of the uncle and the aunt of Jesus, Zachariah and Elizabeth. And do you know what we learned? We learned that life's interruptions can be God's invitations to get us in on what God is doing for His glory. Are you getting in on what God is doing right there in your little corner of the world? I pray that you are. This week, we're going to see an even more familiar character of the Christmas story. You know him as the daddy of Jesus. His name is Joseph. And we're going to see as we look at his story that life's interruptions are actually life intersections. And we get to choose. Are we going to live in fear or are we going to live in faith? It's been more than 20 years ago now. Our family had come to visit a close family friend, Mr. Mickey Mouse, in Orlando, Florida. And I was a pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. It was Saturday, and we wanted to maximize the day. That's what we do in the Purvis Pack. And so it was late on Saturday evening when we began the drive back. And as we headed out to make our way to connect with Interstate 75, we began to realize it was jam-packed. Now, this was the, before the day where our cell phones had easy directions. It was before the day for us even of a car GPS. So I relied on what most of us men rely on, which is this inner natural instinct of direction. And so there on that evening, we pulled back off of Interstate 75, and I came to a crossroad. And I had to decide, am I going to go left or right? It seemed like to me I knew what to do, so I chose the direction that I viewed would be north and head me toward Atlanta, and we began to drive. And we began to drive fast because it was late on Saturday evening. I had to preach the next morning. It was about 45 minutes later along that journey that I saw something that shook me a little bit. It was a sign with these words, welcome to Orlando. I had turned the wrong way. I was going in the wrong direction. I was doing that literally in that moment, but I've done that figuratively of other times in my life. I've come to a crossroad, a crossroad of choice, maybe a crisis, even in my faith. And I made a decision that sent me down the wrong path that resulted in sometimes a lifetime of consequences. Uh, that's why I want you to understand this truth today. Life's interruptions are life intersections. We get to choose. We really get to choose which way we're going to go. And one day, one way will lead us living in fear. Another will lead us living by faith. That's what you're going to find in Matthew chapter 1. Now, what's taking place here is that God has broken his silence. If you just turn the page, one page, just like that. What you'll see is the end of the Old Testament. It's called the book of Malachi. After Malachi was written, God was silent for 400 years. In Matthew chapter 1, we begin to hear the voice of God. As God speaks, inspired to the Holy Spirit into Matthew, and he records these words, we see what is called the genealogy of Jesus. This is his lineage. This is the humanity, the human side from which Jesus was born. But now when we get down to verse 18, we recognize that Jesus also has a divine side. And most of you know that. We learned that in vacation Bible school or early Sunday school, that God was 100% human in Jesus and 100% divine. Look at Matthew chapter 1, beginning of verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. That's a good stopping point because that word birth is important for you to understand. You've heard it before, even in Scripture. In fact, if you turn to the very first page of Scripture, you're going to see it. It's the word Genesis. It's the same thing. And it reminds us that God is in the business of creating. Say this with me. Say, do a new thing, Lord. Say that. Yeah, that's our prayer when we come together, and it's important you understand that. I want to give you permission. You don't need to come to church if you're just jumping through hoops, if you're just checking off a box, if you're just going through a ritual. 
I come because I want to be changed every time I come into the presence of God, every time I see his word. And when God, the creator, begins to create in a new way in my life, you know the result? It's great creations. We see this throughout history. Some of the greatest art that you see in all of human history, if you look at its origin, it was inspired as artists either got into God's Word, had time with Him in prayer, or sat under the teaching of God's Word. This week, I had a sweet surprise. My friend Steve Baker, he called up and he said, you know, when you were preaching on Daniel, God began to stir in my heart. And I went home that very afternoon and I took out a canvas and I began to paint. And so this painting that you see right here of Daniel in the lion's den, that's the creative masterpiece of somebody just like you who sat in a room just like this and listened to the Word of God, and God began to do a new thing in their life. And so here's my question for you today. What new thing does God want to do? Lord, do a new thing. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, again there, there's some confusing things we need to understand. What does it mean to be betrothed? In the biblical setting in which this story takes place, there were three stages in the marital process. The first stage was engagement. But it's not what we mean by engagement. And, and in fact, it may surprise you that in that setting, engagement took place when a parent, maybe a mother, a father, arranged the marriage, listen to this, of two children. Historians tell us that sometimes it was even a little different than that. Sometimes that marriage took place as a result of a professional matchmaker. And they were engaged. Those children would then grow up, and when they were of the age where they could actually be marriage, the female, the girl, the teenager, the young lady, she would have the option. Do I really want to go through with this? Is this the guy I want to covenant with God to be married to for the rest of my life? If she chose not to, they could break it off right there. But if they chose to, then they would enter the stage of betrothal. That's what it says that Joseph was in. He was betrothed to be married. What does that mean? They each still lived with their mother and their father, but in the eyes of the law, it was as if they were married, except for one thing. They did not know each other, as the Bible says. And another way we could say that is they had not consummated their relationship. For, for those of you that are still not following along, this was not a sexual relationship. So for that period of a year, there was this legal contract. They were expected to be married. They had all the obligations without that part of marriage. It is one of the most exciting parts. In fact, the only way you could get out of betrothal is to have a divorce. Or if one of the partners, the male or the female, if they had committed adultery, if they had violated that covenant, not only would the marriage not take place, but that individual could be stoned. They would get the death penalty. Does that help you understand what was taking place for Joseph? So let me just review and pause, paraphrase what we've read. Here's this guy named Joseph, and he's betrothed to be very married to Mary, but he's just found out she's having a baby. You talk about an interruption. That is a big interruption. That's why we have to understand that life's interruptions are life intersections, and we get to choose. Are we going to live in fear, or are we going to live by faith? Well, what happened? Look at verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, that describes his character, how he viewed things. He was unwilling to put her to shame, so he resolved to divorce her quietly. He had made a decision. In order to keep Mary from public shame, in order to keep her alive so that she would not be stoned to death, he wasn't going to say, hey, she's expecting a child. He was just going to divorce her quietly. Look at verse 20. But as he considered, as he considered these things, how often do we make decisions without considering the consequences? 
If, as I look at my worst decisions in life, I can just tell you, they might have happened in the heat of the moment, on the spur of passion uh, for something that I wanted to do, but I didn't think through the consequences. And that's true of you too. So Joseph began to think this through. He considered these things. And notice what happens. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Say that. Say, do not fear. Over and over and over again in the Christmas stories, we hear from God to these key characters saying, don't be afraid. Literally in the Greek language, this is translated, stop being afraid. Remember our one truth for today, life's interruptions are actually life intersections. We get to choose living in faith or living in fear. So he's making a choice. The angel continues, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, for us we begin to see this story unfold at that moment. We recognize the name Jesus. I, I need you to understand another contextual truth. The name Jesus was simply just not a big deal. It did have meaning. It, it means the Lord saves, or really from the Hebrew relevant, Joshua, it would mean Yahweh saves. But there were a lot of Jesuses in the neighborhood. At this point, Joseph's just listening. Okay, that's like saying you're going to name him John, or you're going to name him Mark, or you're going to name him Tom, or Timmy, or whatever. You're going to name him Jesus. Let me illustrate that another way. If I were just to say the name Winston, it might trigger a thought in your mind, but there are a lot of Winstons throughout history and in the world. If I were to say the last name Churchill, yeah, that again makes us, in light of history, think of a certain person, but there were a lot of Churchills who lived. When I put the two together and I talk about Winston Churchill, I, I think of some of those great quotes where we're told never to quit, where we're, we're told to go forward. I think of a great leader. When you heard the name Jesus, that was common, but the angel describes Jesus in another way. He's Jesus the Christ the anointed one, the one who saves. So for us, having understood that, those of us who gather in a place like this, on a day like this, we recognize, oh, Jesus, 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 there's something special about that name. Early this year, before we realized we were in a worldwide pandemic, I was on a group of pastors, with a group of pastors on a call with a distant mentor, Pastor Jim Cimbala. He was in New York at the time. We were just listening to him, talking about some things that God was teaching him. And he said, you know, one of the things God's teaching me is when I, when I don't understand what's taking place, when I, I can't see God's hand maybe right then at work, I simply just need to say the name Jesus. And it settles me. Maybe we should try that right now. You ready? Let's just say that together. Jesus. Just say it again. Just say it with some passion. Jesus. So the angel said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This too had meaning. It means God with us. How about let's say that. Say, God is with us. God is with us. And yes, he is. I know because I brought him with me. I'm indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. If you are a follower of Christ, so are you. God is with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He did it. He, he did what he was supposed to do. How would our world be different if people like us who meet and we sing songs of worship, we open the word, if we just did it? If when we left these rooms, we didn't leave our decisions on a seat like a crumpled up bulletin, we just did what God was saying to do. We lived and our lives reflected Jesus. Well, he took his wife. He didn't know her until she had given birth. In other words, they'd never consummated the marriage. But he called his name Jesus. We know that Mary and Joseph continued to live a, a wonderful life together. They had other children 
like James, who would write the book of James in the Bible, half-brothers and sisters of Jesus, they went on to father the Son of God. And I think in that moment, Joseph learned this truth. Life's interruptions are life intersections. I've got to choose. Am I going to live in fear? Or am I going to live by faith? I I felt a strong urging before I began this message to encourage you to do something before we continue. In a moment, I'm going to pray. I want you to pray with me. But I feel like God needs to interrupt some of us. It may have been something I ate for breakfast, or it it may be a, a divine moment. But I just sensed as worship was taking place, as I watched some of the behind the scenes things going on, and we just need to take a deep breath. Maybe even our tech team needs to do this. Maybe ushers and greeters and staff need to do this. Maybe you who've come in with a dispute in the car on the way or something going on at your house that's unresolved, maybe you just need to take a deep breath and say, God, would you interrupt this moment with your majesty? So let's do that. Let's take a deep breath. And let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've gathered to do what could seem like ritual. In fact, our forefathers and foremothers in the faith have done this for a couple of thousand years. We're we're corporately worshiping you. We're, we're gathered in a group, and we've, we've done the things we've always done. We, we've sung songs. We've prayed. Now we've read Scripture. But we don't need what too often we get, which is no change. We need you to speak into this moment, giving us something we don't have, teaching us something we don't know, making us something and someone we've not yet become. So yes, interrupt this moment with your majesty. Interrupt this place with your presence. Interrupt our lives with your lordship. We need you. God, I need you. I need you to move me out of the way, giving me the words to say and the thoughts to think so that they might be pleasing to you. You're my strength. You're my redeemer. I I need you to... Produce that miracle work that you do of salvation today for someone present, perhaps for someone watching you. God, I need you to change me. So that's our simple prayer. In the name of the one whose birth we read about, the name who calms our lives, in the name of the one who saves, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Think about that truth. Life's interruptions, life intersections. What path have you most commonly chose when you've faced life's interruption? Think about Joseph for a moment. This was an unexpected development. (laughs) He did not see this coming. It's an unwanted circumstance. He would have not chosen that his life play out in this way. It was an unexplainable event. He he didn't understand in the moment the why, the how. And yet he chose to trust. All of these things, unexpected developments, unwanted circumstance, unexplained events, all of these things create crises of choice. And all of these things can take place in our lives. You could have unexpected developments. Maybe it's an unplanned pregnancy. Maybe it's that medical report that did not go your way. Maybe you were called in thinking you were going to get an attaboy or a girl, but you learned your job was phased out. Unexpected development. Maybe it's a worldwide pandemic. Then we have unwanted circumstances. These things we encounter, these trials, these challenges, the storms, as we often discuss, that we're all going through, but we don't want to go through them. 
Maybe it's one of the above things, or perhaps it's desertion. You married Prince Charming, or you married your queen, and one day they just deserted you. It's not what you wanted, but you find yourself there. Or maybe it's death. You've lived your life with the love of your life, and now you find yourself longing for heaven as they've gone ahead of you. Maybe it's an unexplained event. You look at some of the things you've encountered, and you just want to know why. And so you're at a crossroad. And you've got two choices. You can take things into your own hands and you can play the part as if you're God or you can trust Him. You can go forward in fear or you can go forward in faith. Joseph made a choice and his choice changed history. In fact, we would not be here today were it not for the choice of Joseph. Look at his choice again. Verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep as the angel of the Lord commanded him, He took his wife, but he did not know her until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. You see, when Joseph made that choice at the crossroads of crises, his choice affected you and I. It was a consequence. He did as the Lord commanded, exactly as the Lord commanded. No shortcuts, no ifs, ands, or buts, no deviation. He made the right choice what I desire to do in my life. I wonder how the story would have been different if that were you or me. I wonder if we would have tried to make a deal with God. Perhaps we'd have thought, well, now since Mary's pregnant, we should just go ahead and be together anyway. I know we're not married yet, but everything else has changed. I don't know what he was thinking, but we have the inclination that he went exactly as God told him to go. I want to develop that discipline in my life. I want to make spiritual choices that honor God in that way. The right choices in my spiritual journey, in my relationship practices, in my educational pursuit, in career paths, in marriages. How about you? How do we do that? How do we make those choices that then make us? Let me give you four things. First of all, we slow down and pray. Slow down and pray. I'm taking a little liberty here, but I believe that's what was taking place as we are introduced to Joseph in this passage. He hears this news, and imagine what's going through his mind. He's ready to, he wants to get the guy that did this and set things straight. Or maybe he's just hurt because he feels like he has been violated by Mary. But what does he do? After thinking he's got it all figured out, after deciding he'll just divorce her quietly, the Bible says that he took time to consider what was taking place. It doesn't say explicitly that he prayed, but I imagine this very religious young man began to talk to God. God, how could you let this happen? This isn't the way it's supposed to be. We had it all planned out our lives, our hopes, our dreams. And then you interrupted it. I think he was talking to God. I think he was praying. And we learned something here. Before we make any decision, we should pray. When you go through that next trial, when you're facing that tough choice, always ask, Have I prayed about it? When you are trying to counsel someone else that's going through those challenging times, always ask them, have you prayed about it? Now, what happens when we pray? Well, sometimes we get God's yes. I love those moments. You've prayed about something and God makes it crystal clear. For me, most often in my 51 years, it's looked like this. Not necessarily writing on the wall or signs that made it clear, but I've felt God's gentle nudge. I've had a peace to move forward, even if I didn't understand the direction. God's yes. Sometimes I've received God's no. 
Let me go backwards. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever gotten God's yes. Anybody here ever gotten a yes from God? Good. I'm glad. How about this? Raise your hand if you've ever gotten God's no. Let me see your hand. That's tough sometimes. You're, you're thinking, hey, this is what I really want. And then it's like the door is slammed in your face and God says, nope, not going to happen. And often we look back and see it was for our protection or God's provision. Sometimes we get God's, wait a minute, just wait, just chill, take some time. We've learned this truth as we've gathered before. God's delays are not always God's denials. And so sometimes we just need to gather together and wait with the Lord. But sometimes God says, are you kidding me? <laughs> no way, Jose. We've got to be aware, but still we pray. And what happened as Joseph prayed, as he considered? Well, he got a message from God. And I believe whatever the message is, the same thing will happen with you. You'll hear from God. So slow down and pray. And then here's the second thing. See things from God's perspective. See things from God's perspective. Now, we've already discovered that God is at work all around us. We just want to get in on what he's doing. So the message was clear for Joseph. God's got this. It, the decision's been made over your head, Joseph, but it's okay. Just trust him. This is a God thing. We use that phrase today. I've got a extended family member that I often hear them say, well, it was just a God thing. But it's kind of sometimes with silly stuff like this. And they got a close parking place at Walmart. It was a God thing. Or they go into Dillard's and what they wanted was on sale. I guess it was a God thing. <laughs> I'm not so sure God's concerned that much about those details of your life. But I do know that he's in the business of demonstrating his goodness. Often we face things where we can say, this was a God thing. By the way, we know this is a God thing because of how the birth of Jesus is described to Joseph. It was a virgin birth. Now again, this isn't a sex education class, but I want to make sure you understand what's taking place because that's actually central to understanding the truth of the gospel. Mary had not been with any man when she carried Jesus in her womb. Now, why is that so important? It's so important because this baby, Jesus, he would go on to live a perfect life. He would never sin. In fact, he's the only human being that's walked this earth that that can be said of. Because he never sinned, he qualified to do something you and I could not do. He took the punishment for sin for everybody else. Let me just remind you what the Bible says. No matter how good you are, no matter what your heritage, you were born separated from God. And what separated you is that word we've just been mentioning, sin. And sin is not just the things that you do, it's who you are. So if your life today, if it's left undealt with, without a relationship with God, your sin will result in your punishment. And the Bible even tells us exactly what that punishment will be. Sometime with my daughter, we talk about punishment, and she'll ask, what is my punishment? Well, we don't have to ask that when it comes to the punishment for sin because the Bible says the punishment of sin is death. And it even tells us where that punishment will take place. It's called hell. So if our sin is left undealt with, our punishment will be in hell. But God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want that for anyone in your family. He doesn't want that for anyone in your neighborhood. He doesn't want that for anyone in our community. And that's why Jesus was born as a baby. God became man and lived as a man, but never sinned. And if you deny that Mary was a virgin, that Jesus was born of a virgin, you lose that ability to recognize that Jesus, born differently than anyone who's ever lived, never sinned. So what was God up to? What was he doing here? Why is that so important? Well, he was reminding us that things look different if we see from his perspective. He's got the whole thing under control. What's going on in your life that you need to see from God's perspective? 
Maybe it's where you are in your schooling, and you need to say this is God's education. Maybe it's your career, and you need to say this is God's job. Maybe you look at your finances today and you can't figure it out. And it's because you've not understand it was never yours. That everything you have is God's. It's God's money. Maybe as a parent or a grandparent, you're at the end of the rope and you've not understood. These are God's children. You're not seeing it from God's perspective. You're not trusting Him. I understood this more clearly the first time I, I flew on a stormy day. I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. The, the weather on the ground was terrible. There was wind everywhere. It was rainy and stormy. It was a dark and dreary day. Our flight was delayed, but eventually we took off. And, and when we took off, it was not until we got about ten or 15,000 feet in the air that I began to recognize that things looked different above the clouds. Because though I was leaving, I was taking off in the midst of a deeply stormy day, when I got above those clouds, all I could see was the brightness of the sun. In fact, I couldn't even look outside because the, the light from the sun was so bright. See, things look different above the clouds. And that's true in your life, too. That's true with some of these things that you're struggling with, these choices that you're battling. You're forgetting that God has a different perspective from you. It will always be hard to stop being afraid until you begin to see things from God's perspective. So slow down and pray. See things from God's perspective. But there's a third truth. Search for the providence of God. Now, providence is a theological word that maybe you don't understand, though we talk about it a lot in this setting. Providence describes the hand of God over the arc of history. It's just our simple acknowledgement that God is sovereign, that He's on His throne, that He's always involved in what's taking place, even if you don't see Him. So where do we see the hand of God in this story? Look at verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The angel was saying, Joseph, take a deep breath. God's not caught off guard by this moment. Sure, this is an interruption. Sure, you didn't see this playing out this way, but God knew it. In fact, before you ever were born, God said this was going to happen. And that's important that as you look at Scripture, you recognize the prophecies of the Old Testament are what are fulfilled in the life of Jesus in the New Testament. And that teaches me that sometimes the things we see as interruptions are actually God's intentions all along. And when I fight what God has intended to you to do, it, it not only furthers the interruption, it usually results in disaster. When will we learn that God knows better than we do? I was thinking about some biblical examples, and a couple just popped to my mind quickly. The children of Israel had been wandering for 40 years out in what the Bible calls a wilderness land. They wanted to go to the promised land, but they were not there yet. <laughs> and that's like some of us. Our life's been interrupted and we're not where we want to be yet. But the time was coming because there was a new leader. Moses had died. Joshua was in charge. God had told Joshua, you're going to lead the people into triumph in the promised land. So Joshua was ready. And God gave him instruction. Gather the people. Get in a line. Get the marching band suited up. And then start walking around the city. Can you imagine how the conversation must have went? Joshua was saying, yeah, God, that, that sounds good. Now, where do the weapons go? Well, what do we do with artillery? Where are they in the parade? When do we start firing? God, no, 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 you're missing it. Here's what I want you to do. Get all the people in the line. Get the marching band ready. Have them start playing the fight song. And just keep walking around the city. They're like, this doesn't make sense. And God's saying, you're not seeing it from my perspective. You don't understand my providence. And so they do it. And what happens? The walls fall. Great example. But then I thought about another one. Maybe we can all relate to this too, right? 
So Jesus is born, he grows up, and he's a, a, a young boy that, that probably gets into trouble a time or two. He becomes a teenager, he develops pimples and smelly sweat, and, and then he's ultimately a man, and God gives him clearance to, to really begin his ministry. And you remember that first miracle there at the wedding? And so his mom even sees it, and, and God in Jesus begins to call other men to walk with him. And he invests in them. And after he calls them, he, he teaches them. And as he teaches them, he eventually then sends them out. What do we call those men? There were 12 of them. We call them the, the disciples. And so now the time has come for Jesus to die. And Jesus knows what's coming. So he gathers with them and he says, hey, hey there's going to be a time when I'm not still around. So next time you take this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. Next time you eat of this bread, you do it in remembrance of me. But remember this, they'll think they can destroy me. But this temple, it, it will go down for three days, but then it's going to be rebuilt. And he even reminded them of the prophecy that took place in, in the life of Jonah, where Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days. But then Jesus died on the cross. And what happened? The disciples didn't get it. Peter went back to fishing. Some of them went back to their carpentry shop. They were moking them around. Well, that was a waste of three years of our life. In fact, they didn't get it until they hear about and see the resurrected Christ. A couple of them were walking along the road with Jesus, and they just didn't, they were so unwilling to even expect that God would do what he said he would do. They didn't see him when he was face to face. Every time I read that story, I feel convicted because I wonder how often God is working in my life in a direct way, but because I don't trust him, I'm unwilling to to see him. Well, the providence of God. You'll stop being afraid in life's unexpected moments when you understand they were not unexpected to God. So rest in God's sovereignty. Rest in his providence today. Slow down and pray. See things from God's perspective. Search for the providence of God. And then the last thing, seek God's purpose in every situation. What made Joseph do as the Lord commanded? I think it's all of these things we've been discussing. But I believe the last thing, the thing that the angel describes to him in crystal clarity, I believe that's what made the biggest difference. He understood God's purpose in all of this. And in one sense, what God was saying is, wait just a second, big boy. This is not about you. When we learn that lesson, we're better prepared to navigate the paths of life. It's not all about us. The universe is not revolving around us. But God does have a purpose. What's the purpose? Look at verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Everything that was taking place in this story was so that people could be saved from their sin. What does that teach us? God deeply loves people. He loved the people that were living in the world in that day. He loves the people in your little corner of the world today. He loves your neighbors. He loves those in our city. He loves people like you and me because they were created by him and he wants them to be saved from their sins. All that we celebrate at Christmas, all that this story is about is for that purpose, that people, people just like you and me don't have to experience that punishment in the place called hell, but can encounter life through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin. That's salvation. It's the gospel, the good news. God wants to change people's life. I need to say again that it may be that you're here and you're recognizing. I, I've never experienced that in my life. I'm separated from God. I, I don't have that sense of purpose, that hope in my life. I can't begin to see things from God's perspective. When I pray, I don't even know how to pray. And the reason is you've never begun that relationship. You've never been saved. How would our stories look different if everything we saw was through the gospel, through the lens of what God was trying to accomplish for his glory? 
What if God is allowing me to walk down the path I'm walking down so that someone can draw closer to him or, or perhaps that I might know him? Do we believe that God's always working for our good and for his glory? That's what scripture teaches. We learn that in a verse early in our lives if you hang out in church. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things, say all things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. See, God has created you on purpose for a purpose, but you've got to decide, am I going to live by his purpose? It's in 2014 that Kimberly walked out of a doctor's office and called me with news neither of us expected. She had been diagnosed with cancer. We prayed about that diagnosis. Later that evening, we met with our boys. We prayed with them. And then we surrendered the battle to God's purpose. And we made very clear from day one. She made this clear and we made this clear as a family we want God to be honored in this for his purpose, whether it be through doctors or nurses or our church family or co-workers at school. We want them to see that we're going forward in faith, that we're not living by fear. And praise the Lord. On that occasion, he gave her healing from cancer. And I believe he honored that desire. In this moment that we're reading about in Matthew 1, we see Joseph Slow down. He prayed. We see him look at the situation from God's perspective. We see him recognize the providence of God. And then we see him start living according to God's purpose. And what was the result? Well, at that crossroad of choice, he chose right. And he did right. And he honored God. What's going to be your choice when you come to life's intersection? You see, we're there today. Some of you are there in ways maybe no one else knows but you. Maybe you're trying to decide, can I make this marriage work? Should I stay in this relationship? Can I be fulfilled in this job? Do we have children do I move? You've got all kinds of choices you make on a regular basis. And you're at the intersection. And you have to understand that at that intersection, you can choose to go forward in fear or go forward in faith. We've all experienced life's interruptions this year. There's no one I know that can say today that on January 1st, 2020, they knew this was how this year was going to play out. And yet in the midst of this interruption, we stand at an intersection and we have to decide, will we go forward in fear or will we live by faith? A number of years ago, Helen Steiner Rice wrote about this in a short poem. She said, sometimes we come to life's crossroads and we view what we think is the end, but God has a much wider vision and he knows it's only a bend. The road will go on and get smoother and after we've stopped for a rest, the path that lies hidden beyond us is often the path that is best. So rest and relax and grow stronger. Let go and let God share your load. And have faith in a brighter tomorrow. You've just come to a bend in the road. You're at an intersection. A bend in the road. Choose wisely. Let's pray together. In an attitude of prayer, I want to speak to the two groups of us that are always gathered at this moment. First, those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ. What is God saying to do? 
What is the intersection he's placed before you? Where do you need to trust him? Take a few minutes and do some business with him right now. But there's some of you here who've never begun a relationship with Christ. You even walked in today not knowing you would be at this crossroad, but you recognize it clearly now. Maybe you've had some religion. Maybe you've even been through some rituals. But there's no life-changing relationship. You look at how you live, the choices you make. It's not influenced by God's purpose. What are you going to do about that? There's a verse in the Bible that says, today is the day of salvation. I believe that could be true for you. It could be the verse written over your life. Today is your day of salvation. Will you respond to God? Real quickly, again, the Bible says, you and I, we were born separated from God, but we need him. Our sin not only separates us from Him, it determines that if left undealt with, we'll spend forever separated from Him. So that's why Jesus came as a baby. He lived that perfect life. He died on the cross and He rose again so that we can be forgiven and we can have life. You need God's forgiveness. That's your first step on the new path. Would you cry out to Him right now and ask for that? Would you be willing to receive him as the Lord of your life, as the master, the boss? Will you surrender control? You don't need a priest or a pastor to pray with you or for you. There is no magic prayer. But maybe in this moment you could use a little help. So maybe you would pray something like this. Dear Jesus, just to cry out to God, dear Jesus, I need you. I know I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. And now I know that's what this whole story is all about. I'm ready to be saved. I believe you died for me. I believe you're alive today. I, I receive the forgiveness I need. Change me, God. Save me, Jesus. I'm yours. I'm ready to follow you. Now tell him thank you. If you're joining us online, I wonder if you just prayed that prayer, if you'd be bold enough on whatever platform you're viewing this service, just to put in the comment section right now, I just prayed that prayer. But if you're in this room, I, I want to invite you with our heads bowed and our eyes closed to take the first step of declaration. If you just prayed that prayer with me across this room and you began that relationship with Jesus, would you just raise your hand right now and let me welcome you to God's family? That's the most important thing that you could ever do in your life. Welcome to the family of God. God, I pray that today, before our heads hit the pillow at the end of the evening, that we would be able to celebrate that lives were changed because we've worshiped you together. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.